Hi, I'm Robert Coleman. I'm a Senior Applications Manager at Texas Instruments. Welcome to Power Tips. Welcome to Power Tip 52. In this Power Tip, we'll take a look at what's been happening in wall adapters. Uh, Ten years ago, a typical wall adapter was a 60-cycle transformer that would plug into a wall socket. It set down the 60 cycles to a lower voltage. A linear regulator would be used to power the load. Characteristics of this old wall adapter was that it was big, it was clunky, it was very aesthetically unpleasing. Many times it took up more than half of the power connector on the wall, making it ineffective for a second piece of equipment. And then finally they were lossy. At full load, uh, the linear regulator would dissipate a significant amount of power, and even at light loads, the magnetizing power in the 60-cycle transformer would be significant. It might be as much as one or two watts of loss in the wall, and that would be constantly on during the year. So if you do the math, that, that works out to about one or two dollars of wasted electricity a year. So there's been a big move to make these wall adapters more efficient and less lossy. And so what that has done is that's pushed us into switch mode power supplies for wall adapters. That allows us to have a nice compact wall adapter. Um, it'll be higher efficiency over a wider load range. It also gets rid of the no load power dissipation in the uh, power transformer. Uh, typically, when we first started using these switch mode power supplies for the wall adapters, we used a discontinuous flyback. And more recently, we've swapped over to the quasi-resonant approach. So what does quasi-resonance bring to the table? It allows you to reduce some of the losses in the power supply. Uh, if you look at the schematic of a quasi-resonant flyback, you'll see it's much like the discontinuous flyback, and it has ha had some added smarts added to it. And the way the quasi-resonant flyback works is much like the discontinuous flyback. In this slide here, we have the waveform on the drain of the power MOSFET in a, in a flyback. And what we'll see is the MOSFET turns on, and if we had a curve of the magnetizing inductance current, you'd see the current in increases as long as the MOSFET is on, and then you turn the MOSFET off. The drain voltage gets driven positive by the magnetizing inductance of the transformer until it gets clamped to the output voltage. At that time, the magnetizing inductance discharges into the output filter capacitor, delivers load to the output, and then finally, the current returns to zero. And at that time, the output diode in, in the flyback turns off and the drain of the MOSFET starts to resonate. And it resonates around the input voltage here and it starts at the reflected voltage and it rings down neg negative past the input voltage and back up. And in a quasi-resonant flyback, we're kind of smart about when we turn on the MOSFET again. Over here on the left is a typical waveform in a discontinuous flyback, and you can see that there are all kinds of different voltages that you can turn the MOSFET on with. You can turn MOSFET on here with a high drain voltage, or you can turn it on here with a low drain voltage. And the reason this is important is because there's a significant amount of energy that's associated with the, the capacitance on the drain of the MOSFET and the voltage. And, you know, it's one half CV squared is the stored energy. So if you turn on here, you're going to dissipate a lot higher amount of energy than if you turn on at the valley. And basically, that, that's what quasi-resonant flyback is. It's valley switching of the drain waveform on the power MOSFET. And now there's a couple of things that this does for you. One, it improves the efficiency by reducing the switching losses. The second it does is it reduces the EMI in the power supply. In one instance, if you had turned on with this high drain voltage, you would have quite high current flowing in, in the drain of the MOSFET, whereas if you turn on with a low voltage, the currents would be significantly less. So that, that'll generate less EMI in your power supply. Now, what you have to add to a discontinuous flyback to get this valley switching is you have to be able to detect when the drain voltage has reached its minimum. And then the second thing that you have to do is you have to be willing to operate only in discontinuous mode operation. And as we were d discussing in, in the previous slide, the power stage on a quasi-resonant flyback looks very similar to a discontinuous flyback. 
Um, as a matter of fact, unless you could see the, the controller on the power supply, you wouldn't know whether you had a discontinuous flyback or, or quasi-resonant. Again, um, in this picture, we're showing all the elements that make up this parasitic capacitance on, that's on the drain of the MOSFET. There's the output capacitance of the MOSFET itself. There's reflected capacitance from the diode. There's winding in capacitance within the transformer. The MOSFET also has packaged capacitance, and most likely there's a heat sink involved, and that's going to have capacitance also. So there's a significant amount of capacitance. And if you're smart about when you discharge this capacitance, you can make a significant change in the dissipation in your power supply. Uh, typically, going from discontinuous to quasi-resonant, you're going to see 2 to 3 percent improvement in efficiency. Now, as I was talking about a little earlier, you're going to have to add a little circuitry in your power supply to help you achieve this quasi-resonant flyback operation, and that means that you're going to have to use a specialized controller. Um, here's just some examples of TI controllers that you might want to consider. Now, the second thing that the quasi-resonant flyback does for you, it also reduces the EMI in the power supply, and it does it two ways. There was the first way that we discussed in that uh, um, drain voltage had a smaller excursion when you turned it on as opposed to uh, just a traditional approach. And the second thing is, is that there's no perfect operating point for a quasi-resonant flyback, and you're going to end up hunting between different val valleys to get your average operating point to the right spot. And so what that does for you is that spreads out the EMI spectrum of the power supply, and rather than having a single constant frequency point on your spectrum, you'll find that the signature kind of gets mushed out, and so that reduces the, the overall EMI level. Now, the next thing that you have to be aware of with these quasi-resonant flybacks is that they're not going to be constant frequency power supplies. There's going to be some variation in the operating frequency of the power supply. And there's a couple of different control methods to do this. Um, I'm showing my favorite method here, and what we have in these two curves here is we have output power on, on the x-axis. On the top curve, we have operating frequency of the power supply, and on the bottom curve is the primary peak current in the power supply. And so this particular controller, at full load, um, you're at some maximum operating frequency, at some maximum uh, clamp voltage on your MOSFET. And as you reduce load, you reduce operating frequency of the power supply. And so what that does, since the switching losses in the power supply is related to the operating frequency, and basically the power output of the power supply is going to be related to operating frequency in this case, uh, the efficiency is going to remain pretty flat over, over this range of currents from this point right here as the uh, frequency starts going up all the way up to full load. And then after we hit a certain frequency, we're going to clamp the operating frequency. And that's going to be typically um, around the audio range. Uh, so maybe your maximum operating frequency is going to be 150 kilohertz. Uh, you'll reduce the frequency down to maybe 25 or 30 kilohertz and then clamp the frequency there. And the reason you do that is because the human ear can pick up frequencies in, in the 20 kilohertz region. So you don't want to be able to hear your power supply, so you clamp the operating frequency above it. And then at that point, you begin backing off on your primary peak current. And that's how you achieve the reduced output powers. Now finally, when you get into the light loads or no load cases, uh, you're going to go into a burst mode operation, and that's going to give you very good low output power loss. Now here's one example of a quasi-resonant flyback that's used in a wall adapter. Uh, this one's an offline power supply. It has a universal input of 85 to 265 volts. Uh, you see that it's a fairly simple input EMI filter on it and, uh, along with a diode bridge. And then right here is the power stage of the power supply, the MOSFET, um, power transformer, and, and then snubber on the drain of the MOSFET. And so, as we talked about earlier, you turn the MOSFET on, you build up current in the magnetizing inductance, you, you turn it off, the voltage on the drain of the MOSFET flies up, 
that causes the diode in the output of the power supply to be forward biased, delivers energy to the load, and then the current in the magnetizing inductance will decay to zero, and then the diode will turn off, and then the drain on the MOSFET will ring, and you'll do your valley switching during that ringing portion of the waveform. Now this particular IC has a couple of unique features. Uh, typically in an offline power supply, you see an optic coupler that takes area information from the secondary back to the primary to control the output voltage of the power supply. In this particular IC, we've incorporated sensing of the output voltage with our bias line. This particular voltage here from the bias winding is applied to this RC circuit over here. And when the output diode is forward biased, uh, this has a positive voltage on it, and we're able to sense an analog of, of the output voltage. And then we can use this to regulate the power supply. The second thing that we're doing with this bias winding is that we're using it to detect the valley on the drain of the MOSFET. So again, the voltage on the, on the um, bias winding is an analog of the, of the drain voltage on the power supply, and you can use it to determine when to do the valley switching. And then finally, the, this winding is provide bias power to uh, the control IC, and it is also used for over voltage protection. Now, th this is just one case of some of the designs that we have available. There are three very well documented cases available on the TI website. If you look at these links here to the right, you'll find that you can find test reports, you can find schematics and bill of materials of three more pretty interesting designs. So here is an example of one of these uh, quasi-resonant flybacks using an adapter. Um, the size of the adapter is about an inch on the side. Uh, this particular one has a USB connector on it, so you can charge your, your iPhone or, uh, or your Blackberry, depending on who you like. No load dissipation in this power supply is about 30 milliwatts. And that's compared to maybe one or two watts of loss in a 60 cycle approach. Efficiency on this power supply is 80% efficient with diode rectification. Uh, if you wanted to add the cost of synchronous rectification, um, then probably get the efficiency up to about 85% or so. And this is compared to, to a typical wall adapter of about 50% efficiency. So quite a significant amount of power savings available here. So that's it for this power tip. For more power tips, visit Power Management Design Line and search on power tips, or click on the link to all articles in the description section of this video. Thanks for your attention.